Hey everyone, and welcome to my podcast show. My name is Isaiah, and this is the Game Time Gazette, where we talk real sports, real fun, always. We're talking American football, European football, NBA, NHL, MLB, all of that and more. Only thing for us left to do is have fun. Let's get right into it. Let's go. Alrighty. Hello, people of the world, dwellers of Earth. Welcome back to another episode of the Gaming Gazette. It, this is your host, Isaiah Anani. I hope you guys have had a wonderful day up so far. It is Wednesday, February 14th. Um, you know, this is just first week that we're filming these episodes and, you know, pretty cool. Having a lot of fun with it. You know, having a lot of fun just talking sports. Uh, you know, just, yeah, I always loved doing this. Always loved doing <clears throat> Just, you know, giving my opinion on a sport, giving uh, my take on everything. And I've always had, you know, something to say. I've always had that extra to say that, you know, maybe uh, even with my friends, when I talk about them with them, they get tired of hearing it too. So, you know, I appreciate you guys for listening. I appreciate you guys listening on another day. Today's, you know, it was a fun day of basketball. Um, yesterday, there was some NHL going on as well. I tuned into a few games in there. Some fun few fun few games going on last night in the NHL as well. Some high-scoring games in the NHL. So it was like, it was a real fun day uh, last night in the NHL uh, around the association there. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll get into that. It was also a fun day for European soccer, European football. Uh, for all my soccer fans out there, I mean, Champions League was really fun. Uh, we're, we got some more Champions League coming on today. And, yeah, I mean, I don't have, like, a chat, like, you know, where it's Twitch or anything. But, like, I always want to ask, like, you know, like, what are, what are people's favorite sports? Like, what, what do people uh, come out here to watch? I mean, you know, for me, it's really everything. But, like, you know, like, if, if Champions League is on and NHL, NBA, all of these sports are on, what are people watching? And, you know, it's interesting to see how much how much different people from different parts of the world are even – you know, touching this show or uh, hearing it, even though in its it's in its early stages. And I thank you guys for being here and growing with me. But yeah, as we grow, you know, some of those questions, I want to dive into those talks, you know, like, because I love these sports, right? And yeah, like how, how much do other people love these sports? I want to hear other opinions on that. But furthermore, uh, or nonetheless, furthermore, nonetheless, let's get right into it. Uh, let's get, let's start with the, the mundane game in the Champions League last night. Not mundane, not a lot of goals. It was it was a pretty, you know, high intense match from Real Madrid and RB uh Lepis. It was you know, it was a good match. Um, you know, uh, Real Madrid came out the winners. You had uh Brahim Diaz within the forty fifth or the forty eighth minute scoring uh to open up the Real Madrid and I mean the game winner. And uh I mean that was it was a good game overall. It was a good game overall. Uh, I mean, Real Madrid being able to open up. Brahim Diaz made a beautiful individual run by himself, being able to beat a few defenders by himself. Uh, young player, you know, this Real Madrid, I mean, the Spanish kind of uh, farm of players, they're, they're breeding out that next generation. You know, we've seen that golden generation in the 2010s with the Iniesta, Xavi, Busquets, Casillas, Ramos, all those guys, right? And now that next generation is really coming on. We're seeing Lamine Yamal. Um, we're seeing Lamine Yamal. I, I don't believe Brahim Diaz. Let me let me double check if he's even Spanish. I'm even over here talking if he's, if yeah, he is a Spanish. <laughs> he's a Spanish uh I was over here saying it like, but yeah, he, he's Spanish, right? So we're seeing, even though he is 24 year, uh, years of age, he's still relatively young. And we're seeing that next kind of uh, next golden age come up. So, you know, the Brahim Diaz's of the world, the Lamin Yamals, the Pedris, the Gavis and, and such, right? Um, so, yeah, it's exciting. It's exciting for uh, Spanish football. It's exciting for... Uh, football overall, European football overall. Uh, back to the game, Brahim Diaz, yeah, gets the goal. Real Madrid, uh, pretty heavy on the shot. I mean, not pretty heavy. Well, not on the targets. Had 15 shots overall, three on target, 
50 50 possession it was a pretty even match like i said right like looking at the match if you guys watched it as well it was pretty even match lepis really came out they had a few chances there on the counter that they could have made or tied this game up or even taken the lead themselves yeah they had quite a few shots on target you know nine shots on target to end the game and it was like you know they, they were there knocking on the doorstep i'm interested to see when this match is played uh in the second leg, right, when we go over to uh, Real Madrid, or we go, I, I believe, yeah, when we go over to Real Madrid, right, and uh, we go to the Bernabeu, Real Madrid obviously being a good good team at home, they obviously gave themselves the advantage in the in the first leg with a 1-0 win, but I'm interested to see how Lepis is going to respond. This is an interesting uh, matchup here. You know, th that second leg is going to be real fun to watch. It's not going to be one that's, you know, out of you know it's it's for sure done this and that like lepis has a real chance of being upset like you know upsetters here and you know breaking madrid's party breaking their bubble they've had such luck in these last few years so it's going to be interesting i mean they got a good squad are they going to be able to get the goals in the back of the net is the question um that's just really going to be the answer uh, that we're going to be uh, having to ask. Uh, Lulin for Real Madrid has been playing really well. He's the third string goalkeeper. We've seen Kepa go down and we've seen Courtois go down earlier in the season as well. So the Lulin really playing really well here for Real Madrid. I mean, he blocked a really great shot. I mean, in that second half, there was it was straight on to the keeper. It was a volley, you know, but it was a really great reaction saved by him. He's been having all of that type of, you know, action this season. Uh, there wasn't even any, you know, um, there wasn't, there wasn't any, any of the, their their best player right now uh, in Bellingham. You know, he he did he wasn't even in the game. He wasn't even in the match. So that's gonna be interesting to see as well. Second leg is gonna be interesting. I mean, something to watch. It's the Champions League. Yeah, anything is possible. So for a team like Lepis, obviously they don't feel like their chances are over. So that's gonna be a chance to watch. I mean, a game to watch. Especially because they feel like if they converted on one or two of their chances, they would have been able to tie this game up, be able to, or maybe even take the lead before Madrid and, you know, be able to win this game. All right, so let's get to the Man City-Copenhagen game. Uh, that game was, you know, filled with goals, Man City brilliance all over the field. These guys looking so dominant. I mean, it's so Pep Guardiola. That guy, is, his style of play, his... His football, I, I, there's no way you can't tell me that he's not the greatest football manager of all time. You know, you can't put anybody beside Pep. I mean, the teams that he just, he, he, he builds and he commands and he just makes them powerhouses. And then, you know, the excuse that everybody uses is, oh, everybody on that team, I mean, that team is so good. And, you know, when everybody uh, tries to give flowers to a Kevin De Bruyne or a Kev or, or Erling Haaland or a Phil Foden, or, you know, a Bernardo Silva, when somebody tries to give anybody of them flowers, or a Diaz, or Ruben Diaz, any, uh, when somebody tries to give any of them flowers, it's, oh, they're on such, on such a good team, of course they're good. Well, yeah, I mean, there's good players all around. They're in a good system. Of course, you know, the good team is made because they're good players on there. So, you know, just watching them is beautiful football sometimes. You just get enamored by those players and by what they're able to do. Uh, Man City winning 3-1 that was really impressive as well i mean uh, copenhagen we're not really expecting copenhagen to really have too much of a resistance into man city getting into the next round but you know uh man city uh copenhagen came out defending well being able to uh just give man city some time uh some some type of resistance early, even though Man City was getting to the back line, uh, able to make their through uh, run balls, you know, got on the score sheet early. Kevin De Bruyne, 10 minutes into this match, was able to get in, right? But Copenhagen fired back quick, right? Uh, well, relatively quick still in that first half, 34 minutes in, and was able to tie up this game. So, you know, uh, obviously, it's an, again, it's not an opponent that we look at and say, okay, this is an opponent that we're gonna, that's going to give Man City fit. Uh, fits and you know be able to really push them to the brink right but you know uh, for what it was it was a really impressive game you know for given the uh the terms of tiers of opponents and how they're playing right now both of their teams and what kind of momentum they both have in their respective leagues man city uh, th this was a relatively great game relatively great game um you know even for Copenhagen to get into the score sheet yeah it's it's, it's 
it's pretty relative it's it's good it's good for them right and um yeah you know man city just looking like that tank that they're looking at again phil Foden, really this year it's one of the young players of the year this year really i mean um i, I don't know he's getting you know as 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 the the years continue to go on by um we're gonna start have to call him you know he's a veteran you know but he's been he's been playing for a few years now but i mean He's still young. He's still relatively young, even though he's already played on this national team. He's already played in multiple big matches for City. He's still relatively young, and he's still he's still coming of age. And so when he's when he's putting together tallies of goals like he's doing this season, where he's really putting it together and able to find the the back of the net at the consistency that he is, it, it's impressive. It's impressive because he's still so young. You know that there's so much to go. And yeah, I mean. City able to just put themselves into breathing room, you know, vital two goal lead going into the second le uh, into the second leg. You know, again, this isn't a team that we're looking at and saying that okay, City will, uh, City will be uh, beat by Copenhagen or taken out or won't be able to make it to the next round. So yeah, just a quick little insight on that. So let's get on the game rec uh, recaps of the NHL. Like I said, it was a wonderful day for goals in the national hockey league it was a beautiful game let's start with the sabers against the alley knights i mean that one right there was the biggest shutout win since 2001 we seen lucan uh lucan kin make 33 saves greenway has three points for buffalo i mean sabers scored seven goals it was seven nothing as I said, biggest shutout win since 2001. And this is, I mean, that was crazy. I was crazy. I, You know, just being able to see the score sheet. I tuned in for that second period. Sabres were already up 3-0. It was, it was impressive. It was impressive there. Uh, you know, just seeing them score two goals in that. And they were just dominating the game. And obviously, it's probably their marquee win of the season at this point. At, the Kings have been playing relatively well this season, so marquee win for the Sabres as well. I mean, this is just impressive, 7 nothing, right? Um, it was Lucan, Lucan Culkin's uh, fourth shutout this season, and that's the most by a Sabres goalie since Ryan Miller had six in 2011 to 2012. And obviously, you know, the Sabres in these last few years have been on the, uh, on the up, you know, getting a, a bunch of young players a bunch of uh, good veteran guys helping their team build and become much better. And, yeah, they just continue to go up and up. Um, the Sabres, you know, they're 23 and 25, you know, two games under 500, still a, a long way to go. I'm not saying that they're there yet, but still, you know, still got a, a good type of, uh, you know, a few good young pieces there that could they could build around there. Uh, they lost two in a row as well. So this was a big game for the Sabres, just getting kind of uh, a momentum boost as well. You know, did a lot of good things there. You know, uh, played at a great pace, and they just, you know, the Alley Knights just could not keep up with it. Uh, David Riddich allowed five goals on 17 shots before being replaced at the start of the third period by Cam Tal uh, Talbot. Uh, he made five saves for the Kings. And, I mean, they're playing under their second game uh under coach Jim Miller following a 4-0 win against Edmonton on uh, on Saturday after, you know, doing good against that hot Oilers team. But let me just get it real quick because I'm pulling it up right here. <laughs> Bear with me. Yeah, the Oilers against the Red Wings. McDavid has a career high six assists and the Oilers score eight in the win against the Red Wings. I mean, yeah, I, I, was, I was impressive. It was kind of knotted up there. 3-3 uh, three, three at one point, and then the Oilers just scored one and then scored a few more and left them in the dust. And it was a it was a impressive win. Uh, Connor McDavid having an impressive season, had a career high six assists, including his 600 in the NHL, and he extended uh, his home point streak to 19 games. I mean, he's really going for that, you know, MVP again. It's been an impressive season for the Oilers. Obviously, we just we're talking about their 16 game win streak. Um, 
you know, and ape, the, the other things they were able to do this season, getting hot at the right time, the look, really looking to, you know, change the narrative about that team. The narrative about that team was that they could, they're never, you know, not good enough to make it, in, uh, to make a deep run in the playoffs, not good enough to even make the playoffs some years. And, you know, it was, it was disappointing kind of Oilers uh, hockey, right? And, you know, especially with when you had the best player in the NHL, you expected more. You have, you know, uh, honestly, you have a few good players on that team. Not even a few. You got great players on that team with Evan Bucard. You got uh, Nugget Hopkins. I mean, Stuart, Stuart Skinner in the back. It's like these guys. You got you got you got good players on that team, right? So uh, there was expected a lot more expected from the Oilers. And this year, they're really just starting to put it all together. It's been impressive, um, and now we're just seeing them really uh, start to take off as the season continues to roll on. We're going to continue to watch as the watch and cover as the games go on because that's a team that's, you know, to watch and to cover. I think that the Oilers could finally at least, you know, they're definitely going to make the playoffs, but finally at least be able to, uh, you know, maybe win a round or something. Uh, you, let's go to, to the Canucks Blackhawks game. Canucks playing really well this year. Um, you know, they you had uh, Joshua Garland. I mean, Garland scored two for the for the Canucks in the win against the Blackhawks. Uh, really picked up this game. Uh, you know, we've seen uh, just because, yeah, I mean, it was on Sportsnet. The Canucks playing really well. Uh, it was impressive, you know, just full full game they controlled the game uh went up two nothing you know with like 12 minutes left in that second period uh you know and that at that point chicago had like five shots on that right so it was like defensively just really uh being able to shut down the blackhawks and it was yeah it was an impressive game nothing really much to be said i mean from start to finish the 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 um the Canucks were able to just dominate the game. Yeah, it was impressive. Impressive. Um, I want to get quickly over to the NBA. Let's go to the NBA real quick. Had a good game with the Celtics against the Nets. Let's get to that one first. Jason Tatum with four a one, four a one. That whole starting lineup in double digits player that had the least amount of points was Drew Holiday in 14 points but he had 12 assists count him up five rebounds too you know and it, that was impressive man 16 points from Derek White 16 points from Al Horford 19 from Jalen Brown we're talking about filling the stat sheet for those you know starting players they're really just getting the ball into the net the net's able to keep up with them though you know in that first quarter we seen even though Boston still had that eight point lead, even though Boston for the whole game really was in control of the game, had kind of an eight, at least, you know, type of five, four point lead. You know, they had a lead for most of the game, right? But Brooklyn able to just keep up with them. Brooklyn able to uh do their best, you know, to make this an entertaining game, which it was. You know, which it was. Both of them shooting uh, pretty uh, pretty well from the field. Forty nine percent from Brooklyn, fifty two percent for uh, fifty percent from Brooklyn, fifty uh, fifty two percent from for the Celtics. Uh, yeah, and for the Nets, Macau Bridges having a great game. Cam Thomas having a great game. Macau with twenty seven in forty minutes, and uh, Cam Thomas having twenty six. He's he's one of like you know KD had a quote the other day about you know best scores in the league and him right there that's one of the best scores in the league right now and he's what third third year in really really a great player there I I always hope the Raptors were able to get him especially when they were looking to offload pieces when they were trying to keep KD and you know the Raptors kind of sucked and that was like two years ago I was like two years ago and the Raptors kind of sucked and I was like yo if we could trade. I don't know, like, you know, I was, I was I was able to, I was willing to part with OG, you know, them times to be able to, obviously I'm not a GM, I'm not Masai, but, you know, if to get a Cam Thomas, because all the Raptors really needed was a score, put Cam Thomas on that Raptors team with Pascal, Scotty Barnes, Fred, 
It's not a bad team right there. It's not a bad team right there. Obviously, defensively, they'll definitely lack without OG on that spot right there. But, you know, Fred's a competent defender, one of the best defenders in the league for the guards. Scotty's a great defender. Pascal's a great defender. But the only thing is, too, Scotty didn't have the leap that he had this year, uh, you know, three years ago. So that as well, or two years ago. So that as well is is something that, yeah, you know, definitely changes things. But, I mean, current Scotty, current Cam Thomas, that would be, you know, a nice duo there. Going to be interesting. I, I mean, like, just Raptors on the brain. Every time I look at this, it's because, like, you know, the Nets don't know what they're doing. I don't know if they're middling. I know they were do trying to – they were doing some shopping during the trade deadline, but they didn't really make much moves. Nothing significant. I mean, they traded for Schroeder. They traded for Schroeder, but not really any really changes to their team. And it's like they're middling. They're like an 8-9 team in the East. They're not going to make a deep playoff run. They need players around them. Obviously, you don't want to get rid of Macau Bridges. I've seen that you know a few teams are offering for Macau Bridges. And, I, yeah, they'd be dumb to trade Macau Bridges. But, you know, the the Ben Simmons of the world – the um you know nick claxton i feel like the rap i remember the raptors were in like trying to get nick claxton at one point the nick claxton's of the world the dorian finney smiths of the world i mean he had three points yesterday obviously i'm not basing this all off okay one performance in yesterday but like him, like a Dorian Finney-Smith where I seen the post where he commanded or he, where a team offered like two first-round picks for him and the, the Nets declined. I'm like, what are, you, what are we doing? Like, Nets, what are you doing? Obviously, I'm not a Nets fan, but like, what are you doing, Nets? Like, what's the goal? Like, obviously, I, I don't know. Like, Dorian Finney-Smith, you trade him away. You're getting two first-rounders back. Obviously, we don't know what um, position those first-rounders were, but could use those as other assets to get maybe a better type of, you know, player to contribute to the team. The team they don't they have right now doesn't have that kind of they're missing they're missing a few things. Not that they're missing one thing, they're missing a few things, but they just don't have they even with the missing a few things, they just don't have um, you know, the personnel yet to be even I don't feel like the personnel matches up that well with each other you got to get more shooting in there you got to get more uh the ball hand i mean got ben simmons but just be, he's not able to scare defenses because he's not a scoring threat so even though he'd be getting eight assists like he's a great passer he's a great rebounder and his real reliability on his like health barely played in the last few years there for brooklyn so that's something to look at all righty let's move on to the thunder and magic game exciting fun game uh between those two teams last night shea gillius alexander telling all the fans to go home after he scored that game uh you know icing bucket i think there was about like say like a minute left in the game came down the floor uh took it coast to coast and just pulled up not a three, but it was a kind of nice move dribble. I uh, forgot who was guarding and maybe Shugs, uh, maybe Suggs, but um, yeah, I mean, he's he's coming into his own. I seen something on NBA, on ESPN. They were talking about the, the current MVP race, right? And they were talking about the NBA MVP straw poll. And there's a player, uh, a guy at Tim Bone, uh, the guy at ESPN, not a player, a guy at, at ESPN named Tim Bone Temps, and he has like a midseason, I guess, uh, MV, NBA MVP straw poll between a hundred voters, right? And currently, uh, got those got those straw polls back, and Jokic leading the way right now with uh, at number one with 69 first place votes giving him 888 total points obviously with those second place third place you know all tallying into those total points but let's just go on first place votes now or let's just go on yeah let's go on no let's go on total points so yeah Jokic got 889 uh total points Shea got 709 
Giannis uh, for Shea second, Giannis 391 for third, Luca 260 for fourth, and Kawhi 175 for fifth. Wouldn't expected Kawhi if the season started. I mean, when the season started, I wouldn't have expected Kawhi to be on this list. Did not think he would be able to play enough games to be on this list, especially with the new rules that the NBA uh, implemented in this season with the 65 minimum games to be able to qualify for any type of awards or any such thing like that so yeah i did not expect Kawhi to be even even though he's fifth and uh maybe i don't agree with fifth maybe i think he should be a little ah it's tough though because luca Giannis been having great seasons of themselves as well i feel like luca should be ahead of Giannis. i'm not gonna lie luca's been having a phenomenal season bro even uh the 71 points that he scored i believe that was i mean no, no, it's just been phenomenal season for luca he had one month where he averaged like 35 or something like that or 40 i believe something like that or it was a week or something like that but it was no it was a week where he averaged 50 points something like that phenomenal phenomenal it was, he's been having a phenomenal phenomenal season but the also interesting, uh, second interesting thing about this list, other than uh, they saying that Jokic is going to get his third in four years, is that she get the the person that's in second. Well, the person that was in second last year actually won this, won the MVP, and that was uh, Joel Embiid. He was in second place last year. Obviously, it's not like a historical thing where it's like, oh, this is the trend that's going to happen. But hey, I mean. Shea has the capability because not one, not only do we know that in the NBA, voters get voter fatigue where they don't want to vote for the same player every year. They want that story. They vote for the story. You know, uh, we know that because if not, MJ would have more MVPs. Kobe would have more MVPs. LeBron James would have more MVPs. Okay, so we know that. We like that's just. That's just an, a known fact that with the NBA. It's not the NFL where the MVP is like so hard to get because there's 30, just 30 guys. And obviously you have to have the good stats and there's only a few amount of games. And obviously if you have a bad season, bad losing season, you're automatically counted out and all of that. You know, there's different factors that go into the NFL MVP. But for the NBA MVP, you're not just looking at stats and, and oh, like Jokic is doing something that nobody's ever doing before because if they were, last season, Joel Embiid would not have won MVP because Jokic had better stats than Joel Embiid. And, you know, at the end of the season, proved it all that he was the better uh, player for the season with Denver Nuggets winning the NBA championship. So nonetheless, just seeing with all that, though, the story matters, right? And we're looking at the OKC Thunder. Those guys have been atrocious. I mean, the bottom of the barrel. The bottom of the barrel. The very bottom of the barrel for years of the NBA. Where you see them on the schedule pulling up to your team and that's a get right win. You know what I'm saying? And I mean, obviously they changed that they they changed that narrative. This year, last year, they did a good job of being able to shut that down a little bit. This year, being able to completely shut that down. But, you know, being able to change that narrative, which they did, is a, a big reason uh, attributed to that fact is because of Shea Gillis Alexander. Long story short, to make the long story short and to not make the uh, short story long, it's because of Shea Gillis Alexander, right? And we're seeing him do some great things this year you know he's obviously he got the points he got the he got he has the team record um last night he he was playing great he was playing great 32 points five assists uh and uh, three rebounds you know his his stats this season right now he's averaging 34 point or 31 points per game sorry i i seen it as a full but 31 points per game mad impressive mad impressive and i understand this is the inflated nba stats where okay 30 points per game is no uh, not normal that's the superstar standard nowadays right but that's mad impressive man that's mad impressive up until this point into the season four game i mean halfway in obviously we're looking at Giannis with 30 uh he's averaging 30 
And then Luca's averaging almost 35. I mean, ridiculous, brother. Get him, bro. Ridiculous. We're going to even talk on this pod soon about the whole European you know basketball because ball is ball bro and you see luca come back from the european european you know just he grew up in the european basketball style so i want to talk uh, you know we're gonna have an episode about just why a lot of the european guys don't succeed in the nba is it because of this the, the franchise is not giving them a chance is it because of the way they play is it because of their age we're gonna let, just dive into all of that in another pod because that's just a really interesting thing because luka Doncic is not uh the first Euroleague MVP to come to the NBA. He's one of the youngest, probably the youngest ever to come. Or I think he is the youngest ever uh, Euroleague MVP. So definitely, you know, that's he's kind of like an exception. And obviously, he's an out of worldly player, but he did grow up in that system, if you get what I mean. So yeah, we're, we're going to have another pot about that. But back on the Shea Gillius Alexander thing. Yeah, just having a great season 31 points per game. Like, that's that's crazy. That's unheard of amount of points per game. And he's leading the Thunder to right now, I believe they are in second place in the NBA Western Conference uh, with 37 wins and 17 losses. Just a game beha- behind the Timberwolves, who also, you know, Anthony Edwards deserves to be getting some love, too, because them, I mean, them guys crazy chris finch crazy 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 turnaround from that franchise that franchise was poverty years ago and it was another team that you look at it and it's just a get right win chris finch coming from that toronto raptors nick nurse he was a nick nurse assistant all oh, that nick nurse coaching staff had so much head coaches now such a good head coaching staff i miss that team i miss it it's 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 okay we're not going to dwell on the past, look to the future, and and have hope. Just like the Thunder and the Timberwolves did. Ah, just fun, fun teams, fun teams. It's going to be interesting to watch as, as they grow. Magic, obviously, you know, they lost yesterday. In a, in a, in a, you know, Thunder kind of controlled that game back and forth. It wasn't even kind of too close. Jillian Williams with 33. Him and Shea combined for 30, I mean, for 65. It wasn't, it, it was, it's hard. It's hard when two players are killing you that bad. But Paolo had 23. Wendell Carter Jr. had 22. Franz Wagner, who's been really good all season long. One of the better, you know, rookies from that 20, uh, 2021 class. Just all those guys, you know, the, 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 the magic as well. On the up and up, probably going to make the playoffs this year. Uh, I don't foresee them making a deep playoff run, but, you know, as the years go on and as they add to this team, yeah, you could definitely see this Orlando Magic's team breaking out of the poverty curse that they've been stuck in so long since Shaq left them after four years. And we got to talk about that a little bit before we're going to end the pod. I mean, they they had the, the Shaq jersey retirement here tonight, uh, last night at the Orlando Magic game, and it was like... The guy only spent four years there. <laughs> like, that's actually really crazy if you think about it. He spent his rookie contract there, which you're obligated to in the NBA for rookies. You can't leave on your rookie contract unless you're really forcing your way out with the trade. Back then, they did not do that, so that did not happen. Or the play- or the team just doesn't like you or just not a good enough player or just, you know, you're just a bust, this and that, and they trade you. But leaving after your first four years just i don't know how you get your jersey retired and i love Shaq. i love Shaq, and i think he deserves to get his jersey retired with the lakers i even think when they retired it in miami as well i was like okay cool all power be to them because he won them a championship he left a legacy there but for the orlando magic he has done nothing but just I mean, they made it to the playoffs uh, the, the the years that we was there. Him and Penny, that combination was pretty good. They were able to make it to the finals that one year and got beat up by the Houston Rockets. Like it, they got beat up by Hakeem, <laughs> you know. Uh, I believe it was a sweep. So just got to look at that, and it was like, what are we doing? It was, it, was, it, was, it was an eye, eyebrow raiser, you know. I uh, just didn't expect it. Um, obviously it was announced probably a little while ago, but just 
not being in to date with the Orlando Magic and what they got going on. And when it happened, I was like, what are we doing? Like, I just, it was surprising. And I love Shaq. It's not even a, a, a you know, a diss on Shaq or anything, but it, I'd feel the same way. I feel the same way if the Raptors are, like, would consider retiring Vince Carter's jersey. And I know this is a controversial opinion, but, bro, the Raptors should not retire Vince Carter's jersey. Shouldn't even consider it. Why? He only stayed here for the time that he was required to. He never really, like, I mean, yeah, he was able to, Vince Sanity, put the Raptors on the map. On to, yeah, but the Raptors were a young team. If he wasn't going to be able to, if he wasn't going to do it, somebody else would have. Promise you that. I promise you that. Because at the end of the day, 10, 15 years later, Kyle Lowry, DeMar DeRozan pull up, bench mob pulls up, and the Raptors get an identity that they never got before, got respect that they never got before, got fans in Canada that they never got before, fans all over the world that they never got. I mean, Max Holloway from the UFC, he's not even Canadian, but he, he became a Raptors fan because we were so gritty, because we had an identity. We were, we were a team. So just that like i wouldn't you know you, you give you you retire someone's jersey because it means something to like that his time in the city meant something to him not that he was just here for a short time and then he left you gotta see that it meant something to him too you know Obviously, I don't like it. Probably meant something to Shaq. I feel like yeah, he's from the Orlando, from the Orlando area as well, something like that. But just four years there, it's like they didn't even win them a chip. Just made it to the finals. I get that they weren't, you know. But Dwight Howard did a lot for the Orlando Magic, if we're gonna be honest. And the time that he spent there, you know, even though he and end, eventually ended up leaving as well, but he didn't just spend his rookie years there, right? So it's tough you know two sides to the coin at the end of it all it's just an opinion that i have his jersey is gonna be up in the rafters forever and congratulations to Shaq for that all power to him and all power to the orlando magic you know that's it's an achievement that you'll never be able to nobody will be able to ever take from you and uh yeah, but if the Raptors, Raptors, you know, that's the same thing. Yeah, I, you know, I can't like if they ever consider retiring Vince Carter's jersey. It's like I understand Vince Sanity, this and that, but he didn't even spend enough time here, and he left such a bad way, like in such a bad way. I understand that he was loved when he was here, but he left in such a bad way. The first person. The first two people that you consider, because you got to do it at the same time, first two people that you're going to retire their jerseys is Kyle Lowry and DeMar DeRozan, period. Then you got to do Pascal's, all of them, but Kyle Lowry and DeMar DeRozan, period. Not even no Kawhi Leonard, even though he won us a chip. Even he wouldn't want the jersey retired, even though he won us a chip. And that's going to be an interesting one, though, because that's a touchy-feely one, though. But... I'm going to leave it there. It's been an awesome day talking with you guys, man. I just love it. I love coming to the mic and talking. Um, you know, I hope you guys have an amazing day. We'll be going um, next week as we, uh, you know, have, you know, I, I guess I'll finish out this week and get an episode out every day. But next week and the weeks on coming and for the rest of time and that I continue on this beautiful earth talking uh, on this beautiful mic to you beautiful people we'll be doing it mondays wednesdays and fridays covering all the same sports with all the same analysis with a great conversation so join me on this journey as we continue to go on this way of life it's gonna be fun it's gonna be awesome i'm gonna have some fun you're gonna have some fun you're gonna have a great day i'm gonna have a great day it's been your host, Isaiah Nenny. This has been the Game Time Gazette. Thank you. Love y'all. Peace. Peace.